Shut up and sit down. Hey everybody, it's June here on Toy Talk. Hope everybody's had a great month and that everything's going well in your lives. And like every month, I want to teach a little something as we start out the show. And this month, I want to talk to you about giving. You know, the Bible says that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And this is not just a Christian or a Bible concept. This is something that has been espoused by moral teachers and religions the world over for many years, for millennia. And giving is a very good thing. Let's be honest, it feels good to give to people. You give them something they want or they like or that they need, and it meets a need in their lives. It makes them feel good. You feel good for giving it to them, and it's a win-win for everybody. So this is a great verse to learn from, that it is more blessed to give to receive. And if the verse just said, it is blessed to give, I'd be perfectly fine with that. But it doesn't say that. What it actually says is that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Well, if I were to be honest, and most of us, if we were to be honest, it honestly feels better to me when I receive than it does to give. You know, over the years, I've given away cars, and I've also been given cars. And I'll be honest with you, when I give given a car to somebody, I knew they were no longer going to have to uh, ride the bus or arrange rides, get a cab, walk places. It felt good to meet that need in their lives. But to be honest, when that was given to me and I no longer had to do those things, it felt better. So why does it say that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive? Well, I'll tell you, it's because the two are completely intertwined. You know, before on Toy Talk, we've talked about what we call the law of attraction. In Christianity, they might call it sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. In Hinduism or other religions, they would call it karma. In other words, what it is that we do or what it is we give brings back more of that same thing to us. You know, we talked about how we see the world in a physical realm. We see a physical body, but in reality, everything is energy. If we looked underneath, there's organs and there's cells and there's atoms and there's molecules. As you break it all down, it's energy. If we looked under a high enough, a powerful enough microscope, we wouldn't see flesh, but we see energy. And the energy that we send out brings similar energy back to us. And this is why it's more blessed to give than receive. We talked about um, Dr. Masaru Emoto and how he has shown this in the physical realm, that he did experiments with water, and that he showed the water that was surrounded by positivity, positive words, positive actions. When he froze it and took pictures under a microscopic camera, the positive environment water had came out so that it looked like crystal clear snowflakes. It looked all positive. It looked beautiful. But he did the same thing also with water, putting it in negative environments with negative words. And when he took those pictures, it came out all dark and chaotic. And it's a great way to show in the physical realm how it is that what we send out is brought back to us. In other words, what we give, we receive. You see, this isn't just talking about giving something physically, the act of giving a gift or you know, giving a present. It's what we're sending out. We talked about this. If we were to picture it as if the energy was, if negative energy was red, we sent out anger and it was red, it would draw back more red. It would draw back more anger. As we send out love, it draws back more love. What it is that we give out is what is sent back to us. And this is why it is more blessed to give than to receive. So whether we are giving gifts or not, what we're doing throughout our entire lives, every action, every word, every thought is something that we are giving out into the universe. And what happens that is that what we are giving is brought back to us. And this is why it's more blessed to give than to receive because we are dictating by what we give what it is we are going to receive. So watch what you're doing, pay attention, think about things before Think about your thoughts. Think about your words. Think about your actions, because what you're sending out is going to come back to you. We're going to cut the message, and we're back with a special feature this week. High noon in Gotham City. A deserted warehouse on the outskirts of town. And a ticking bomb spells trouble for Batman and Robin. 
only breaking and entering. It's Batgirl. Quick, Batgirl. Untie us before it's too late. It's already too late. I've worked for you a long time, and I'm paid less than Robin. Holy discontent. Same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. No time for jokes, Batgirl. It's no joke. It's the federal equal pay law. Holy act of Congress. Can we talk about this later? Will Batgirl save the dynamic duo? Will she get equal pay? Tune in tomorrow or contact the Wage and Hour Division listed in your phone book under the U.S. Department of Labor. Hey everybody, it's Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. And it just so happens that this year, Star Wars Day also happens to fall on free comic book day. So I am here at Paper Asylum in Beverly, Massachusetts to check out some of the things that are going on. Let's take a walk inside. Okay, well right off the bat for free comic book, we've got the table of free comic books. Got some great stuff on here. Now this one caught my eye, Weapon, number one, a character that I'm actually not familiar with. But some, of course I am. We've got Doctor Who. Got some Riverdale and Spawn. Got Bloodshot, Robotech, all kinds of free comic books. I hope you all got out for free comic book day and picked up your comic books. Great time to have every year. And we're gonna go ahead and talk to some of the artists and authors that are here to uh, join the staff at Paper Asylum. Okay, so we're over here with our first artist and you are? Ashley. Yeah. Ashley, and what exactly do you do? Um, so I make a lot of comic work, I make a lot of um, books, zines, a couple prints, um, mostly I make things for more feminine identifying people, okay. um, just kind of showing uh, more of what we deal with <laughs> in the world. And Absolutely, kind of things like coping mechanisms, <laughs> yes, would be something we deal with. All right. Yeah, that was um, my first book that I published when um, okay. when I was a senior in high, uh, college. It was my thesis, and I kind of put it together, an anthology of what my time was being uh, an illustrator that was working and in school and trying to balance life. And it can be a real balance, I know, <laughs> yeah. So uh, how long have you been putting out books? What is the, How long has it been since you put out coping me mechanisms? Uh, about two years. I graduated in 2017, so it's actually a couple weeks shy of the two-year anniversary of this book, too. Okay. Pretty cool, and I've put out pretty much something every year since. Um, okay. I put out this zine about reproductive health um, last summer, and then I just finished this one this spring um, that's just more of a comic-based uh, zine that's only like 12 pages. <laughs> sure. uh, excellent. We look forward to seeing more of your stuff out there. All right, nice to meet you. Moving right along, we've got a table with our graphic artist and our illustrator, and your name is? Morgan. Morgan, and can you show us a little bit of your work? Sure. I mean, um, so I, I draw a lot of, like, I draw a lot of animals. I draw a lot of, I mean, landscapes, mountains, and stuff like that. I like to incorporate a lot of color into my work, and I try to make them more abstract because I've been used to drawing realism for so long, so I'm trying to break out of my comfort zone. Okay, so, and I'd say you definitely got the abstract and the colorful down. The gorilla? Excellent. It's, it's great to see all this work. You guys have done so much talent. And you are? Um, I'm Jess. Hey, Jess. Hey, Jess. Okay. <laughs> all right, so, and Jess, you do more illustrations. I do. Um, I'm an illustrator and a uh, comic artist, and I also write my own comics as well. Excellent. You have some of the stuff you've written? I do, yeah. I wrote this one my senior year of college uh, okay. for my thesis. This is called a back seal. Tell us what's it what's it about? Give us a little uh, bit of a background. So it's a romance story okay. um, about a ranger who has to save the forest that uh, the woman she loves lives in. Well, and obviously a lot of forest type background. We got the dragonflies, ladybugs. Yeah, excellent. I'm really, I'm really into drawing like fantasy and uh, flowers and nature and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a back seal is another one for you guys to check out. Moving right over here to I believe it was Ron. Ron. Yeah. Ron. Yeah, absolutely. Ron the third. And Ron, you were showing me some of your cover art you were doing. You did some uh, yeah, Earth's did, Mightiest yeah. Avengers, some different yeah. stuff like this. Yeah, I just did um, some sketch covers today for the show. Um, and I have a lot of like Inktober stuff that I've worked on. And this comic, I uh, I wrote the first issue. Okay. And uh, illustrated the first segment of the story. Sure. And this is called Glass Lake. Yep. And what's a little bit of a background on that? Uh, it, me and my buddy Will uh, wanted to do a horror anthology, and okay. uh, we just started kind of working out ideas and stuff, and we settled on the idea of trying to base all of the stories around this one particularly creepy lake in Maine. 
gotcha. um, so yeah it was pretty cool excellent <laughs> sounds good we'll have to check that out as well thank you and over to ravi and I'm sorry, and your friend here. Yeah, and Ravi and Mab. Ravi and company, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and Ravi, let's see a little bit of what you do. Uh, yeah, I'm a comics artist and an illustrator as well. Um, I've got a couple of uh, books out, but today with me I've got some prints and such. Okay. Um, just a few things and some older stuff. Sure. We got like the case for, what is this the case for? The case for Black Andoros. This is okay. uh, a zine that I wrote as part of my thesis uh, in college okay. uh, about Les Miserables. Yeah, so. Some very yeah. niche stuff about Les Miserables. Sweet. Excellent. Les Mis, anyone who's into Broadway, man, way to go. <laughs> All right. Sweet. And I haven't even actually met you. We just kind of slipped Hi, in as we were yeah, filming. I'm, Kurt. I'm Jack. Kurt, nice to meet you. <laughs> and tell us a little bit of what you do. Uh, yeah, I do um, indie comics. I had a book released in 2016 called In Pieces. Okay. Um, so that was like little vignettes about uh, about five years that we lived in Ipswich. Oh, that's where we live. Yeah, We're cool, coming cool. from ICAM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yes, okay. Um, and uh, other than that, like I um, I just basically do like fiction comics. And, okay. And uh, uh, have another book coming out in this fall from Ad House. So. Okay. So yeah. Excellent. Well, it was nice meeting everyone here, and uh, we'll be back in just a few moments after these messages with our interview for this month. Super Friends, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Batman, together for the first time with three new friends, Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog, Super Friends. Superman peanut butter tastes so great. Never. So fresh roasted, so creamy, so yummy, that its secret will be mine, all mine. I foiled again. Just wait, Superman. I'll find out. Superman peanut butter. Its strength is its great taste. All right, well, welcome back. And I am here now with the owner of Paper Asylum, Anthony Carlucci. Anthony, great to have you here on Toy Talk. A pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. And um, it's now Monday. I was out at your store Saturday for free comic book day. Yeah. Um, pretty good turnout? Uh, it was a very good turnout. Um, overall, I think so far this year it was our best day. Um, okay. A lot of new faces, which is very exciting. We had moved down the street from uh, our previous location was at yes. 166 Cabot Street in Beverly. We moved up to 260 Cabot Street. Um, a little closer to the center of town mm -hmm. and uh, nice foot traffic, a little more. Uh, it's a much larger facility. Open. Much larger than the facility, old one. Yes. You're also closer to the Montserrat College of Art, which yes. I'm sure is a core you know, uh, group of people to come yeah, in for your store. Yeah, we, we get a lot of students that come in. We carry um, a few um, art supplies just to help them out if oh, they're kind okay. of in between things. You know, sure. a little bit of ink, a little bit of paper. Of course. You know, yeah. nothing too crazy, but, you know, just as a supplement, well, we're there for it. Well, I do know that most of the people I spoke to at the store, as far as the vendors that were set up, were students or graduates from Montserrat. Yes, we have a really strong, thriving creative community in town sure. uh, between Beverly itself, Salem, the surrounding area. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of talent, a lot of cool people doing cool things. So whatever we can do to help bring that in, yeah. that's what we're there for. Well, Salem in general is just that whole niche of everything. And then the art college, obviously, yeah. is perfect. Now, do you have any kind of association with the art college or just kind of Passive, happen to be in the area? You know, it, they know we're there. We yeah. help where we can. Yeah, like graduate or anything. Any type, any type of uh, crossover that we can do. A, a quick example is uh, they just finished a comic book class. So okay. the night before, you know, the Friday night before Free Comic Book Day, the professor was out ah, perfect uh, timing. Printing, printing copies of all the kids' books so that they would be in for Free Comic Book Day, and we were able to at least have those on the shelves and so present them to That's great. So it wasn't just library. like what you see across the country. You had stuff that was very specific and yeah, local. Yeah, we try and have a few area. things, you know, at least something that is very specific to the area. And, mm -hmm. you know, try and make it a, a destination because absolutely frankly you can get most comics from marvel or dc yeah in most most towns in the country sure. there's at least a comic book store relatively close of i'm course, sorry yeah. i know some places there aren't i know um but in general that's not a differentiator so mm -hmm. where we try and differentiate ourselves is to find creative craftsmen to bring in new things that you can only get either via their portals or in our shop 
Excellent. Now, speaking on com Free Comic Book Day, the first book you brought in was one of the free comics from this year. It was uh, almost a free comic. Uh, oh, I'm it was sorry. a free was... comic in our shop because um, like, it's a 25 cent comic. Eh, How gotcha. am I going to charge for that? Exactly. So, uh, this is uh, DC's Year of the Villain. Year of the Villain. And they're setting up all of their bad guys. Uh, Lex Luthor decides that he's going to basically uh, cash infuse. All of the villains. So this is Luther-based. Okay. And lay out a big plan for them. Well, so we think. By the end of this issue, we find out that there are other machinations behind Luther as well. But, uh, uh, okay. but uh, Luther is sort of the kickstart for everybody. So coming and into July, I think we start seeing uh, the uh, what the offer is okay. and how each one of these villains is going to try and take on. Who their are hero. some of the other specific villains that are you know mentioned in it? The big ones that I've featured. seen now, not too many are specifically uh, uh, illustrated in this, but I think Bane is going to be a big one. I think yes. Lobo <laughs> is going to come in really big. Okay. Weirdly, um, uh, Red Hood, who is the the, Kinda, the dead Robin, yeah, yeah. Um, who had come back, he's been riding the line and uh, apparently he's getting an offer, which is very interesting. Hmm. Barbara Gordon Batgirl is getting an offer, which is very interesting. That is very interesting. Okay, she's, she's not a about as good villain. as good gets. Yeah. So, uh, although now, it's are a they villain playing her as thing, Batgirl or as Oracle? No, we're back. To, we're back to full Batgirl. Okay. There is there is an evil Oracle, of sure. course. Yeah. Um, but. For the last handful of years, it's been a fairly traditional Barbara Gordon okay. being a fairly traditional good guy. Yeah. And now we're getting some machinations in place that gray things out a bit, which is going to be, I think, very interesting. That sounds very interesting. I yeah. mean, he's seeing, you know, a twist on Batgirl is always it's, great. It's always yeah. the challenge in the Bat universe because you have a bunch of different characters that kind of all do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So giving all of them somewhere new to play is 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 a lot of fun. And the great thing in the Bat universe is there's always a lot of gray area. Mm -hmm. Even in Batman himself, he's a good guy, but he's about as dark a good guy as you get. You well, know, he is he, he, kind of a vengeance to do the good. He does do some good. questionable things to yeah, say the oh, least. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's always, uh, there. there's a comic book that just came out this past week called Deceased, which is okay. an out of continuity, I'll call it a zombie comic. It's sure. not quite a zombie comic, but it's in that ballpark. And, you know, one of the first things that happens, uh, Victor Stone, Cyborg, yep. a thing happens with him and Batman's like, oh, I know where he is. And the Justice League is like, you have a tracker on Vic? He's like, um, yeah. Yeah. And this is where the, the kind of conflict has always come between Batman and Superman. Yes. And, you know, that shifts us into, I know at the end of the newest movie, Shazam, we get a little glance at Superman being yeah. there for those who haven't seen it. But talk, tell us a little bit about what's going on with Shazam. Well, Shazam Same with is, uh, is <clears throat> Shazam back in the day, in the 40s, was a character that actually outsold Superman for a very brief oh, yeah. period of time. Very that popular. led strongly into uh, the corp the company that was DC at that time, suing the company that had uh, Shazam at that time, uh, retaining regaining those they were rights very and similar, basically eliminating uh, the Shazam character for a number of years. Uh, since he came back, he's had a hard time kind of finding his footing okay. against Superman. Sure. Um, yeah. the, the challenge has been, you know, it's kind of what I was saying with the Batman characters, finding a proper mission statement for this character. We're finally at a point, like, I've always kind of seen it. I love Shazam. I think I Shazam's Shazam. great. Loved him in the 70s cartoon. You know, Little well, kid, cartoon, but early morning. says a magic word, wish Bam. fulfillment, big person yes. can do a lot of things that you can't do as a kid. Exactly. A fun, fun story for kids. Exactly what I was going to get at. Shazam is so much, at least now, they're making him so much more fun and lighter than mm -hmm. Superman, which is the big... That, that no change. That's the lane that I think that character needs to stay in. Yes. I thought the film did a really nice job of riding a line between being kind of corny, but mm -hmm. motivating all the characters with things that are relatable. Yeah, you know, a, a, absolutely. A, I don't know if I want to say a darkness, but something that's a little bit more hard hitting. Mm -hmm. Everyone had something to do and some place to go within the context of their character in okay. the film that helped motivate everyone to the end. Sure. And I thought it was. 
you know, certainly one of the better recent additions to the DC Definitely canon. for DC. And you know, the thing that really jumped out for me in the movie itself was it really showed me how important a good villain is. Yes. Oh my gosh, he made the film. Yeah, they did a he nice was, job. I they mean, Zam was took, great, but... They kind of took Savannah <laughs> and uh, the one of the early Captain, um, well, Shazam villains was a, a guy named Captain Nazi. And oh, okay. I, didn't even know I that. think being, I think using a character named Captain Nazi in 2019 might be a little much. So yeah. if you take sort of the <laughs> so. power set and a little bit of the influence of his sort of magical background, okay. infuse that on Savannah who is, he was traditionally more of a uh, mad scientist character. Okay. So you kind of fuse those two things together and you have a modern take on a villain that can be very sure. powerful against him. And it, it was done very well. Honestly, the only thing I didn't like, and it wasn't even I didn't like it about the movie, is back to when Superman showed up at the end, and you just kind of see a little clip of him from, like, neck down, and yeah. I saw that there's still lost him with that darkness. Man. Hey, <laughs> I was like, ah. I'll say this. <laughs> if you're going to introduce a new Superman costume, I don't think the post credit sequence of Shazam is necessarily, necessarily the spot to true. do it. That's so true, I have yes. to give him a little leeway on that. Because, okay. I mean, frankly, when they were putting this film together, the DC Universe as a combined element was more in the forefront. Now it feels like those films are m more separate. You know? Yeah. Aquaman... Although that was the character that was in Justice League, felt like it was Same with more Woman. in its own, Definitely yeah, its more own in its realm. own world. So and we'll see how things. You know, move with forward. that DC doing their own thing, kind of each character kind of spread out. Marvel is doing just the opposite. Absolutely, they, the MCU universe. It's all linked together, and this is their new story, the movie that's going to be coming out. Eternals is coming. I the rumor I think is that it's shooting 2020, coming out around 2021, okay. and this is where the cosmic universe that we were introduced to in Guardians of the Galaxy, and oh, okay. has got a glimpse of in Captain Marvel, we're gonna get in some very strange territory. The okay. baseline for the Eternals um, as I need to hear this, I'm very unfamiliar with the Eternals. The, the easiest way to look at them is they're sort of the Greek pantheon, but renamed. Okay. Ever so slightly tweaked. Um, that's sort of the easy uh, baseline for it. Then you take all that and you shove it into space and make it even weirder oh. <laughs> than uh, Asgard was. Asgard okay. still kind of played in a very traditional view of what we've seen, certainly in the comics of Asgard. Sure. Um, the Eternals are just like straight up weird. If anything, okay. anything very kirby yeah. anything that you notice that was particularly Kirby-esque from Sakaar in Thor Ragnarok, Okay. Take all that stuff, turn the volume up, and make a whole universe out of it. That's kind of where we're living with the Eternals. How that translates to okay. screen, I yeah, don't know, but I'm, I'm very really interested gonna have to, see. to see. It's, I mean, when you walked in that, it was like, you know, I really have no knowledge background whatsoever of them, so. Good side, bad side. Not that many people knew about the Guardians. Guardians of the Galaxy, exactly. So we're in a similar place. From what I've heard, and this is pure rumor, um, I've heard that the Marvel version of Hercules is going to be kind of our our central character here okay. that helps bring us into this world. Now, that was not That's, the Hercules that came out with The Rock a couple no, of years no, ago. No, no, okay, no. I'm this trying is, to think here. Okay. Uh, Marvel's Hercules is, is mm, how would I even describe him? Um, he's similar to Thor in that he's uh, a drinker and a bit boisterous, okay. but he still has that uh, level of honor and okay. um, duty to, sure. his, to his realm, his father, his gods, blah, gotcha. blah, blah. Um, how that's going to play, again, in these terms, when you're bouncing him now off of Thor, I'm not totally certain. Gotcha. And I'm curious, because they've done such a good job of every character kind of living in their own world, and you don't have too much crossover of okay. what one character needs to do. Sure. I mean, you know, War Machine and Iron Man, sure, they're very similar, well, yeah. but they still have their own paths, right? Exactly, yeah. So, where Thor goes versus where Hercules could go, where all of these Eternals can go, is very interesting to me. Because frankly, yeah, be post Thor Ragnarok, there weren't that many Stumped Asgardians <laughs> left. So now that you have that whole race sort of a little bit on the side, it mm -hmm. kind of makes space for the Eternals to come in. Gotcha. You know, which 
We'll see. It, so it'll it's, be interesting. It'll it's be interesting all to see very how that goes, interesting. I mean, we know nothing about phase four, so seeing how that all plays out is going to be really exciting. Exactly. It's a very bizarre time after a $2.2 million. And we had to save this to close out on Miss Marvel. Like we've said before, you're located in, in Beverly, Massachusetts. Yes. We're Paper Asylum at 260 Cabot Street. Correct. Go so and check it out. But uh, Miss Marvel was created by a Beverly resident. Not quite. Or, oh, okay, so originally um, Carol Danvers was created by Roy Thomas and put in the uh, the Captain Marvel comic book series, which originally starred the character named uh, Marvel. Um, if you have seen her solo movie, the um, Annette Benning character is okay. sort of a stand-in for that version. Sure. Carol Danvers, um, as a character, was introduced in this issue of Ms. Marvel, her original superhero name, um, which was written by Chris Claremont. He decided to put her as a character. She flies in to visit her mom. Okay. So you have a scene where you're in the north... Uh, the northern suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. And then later in this issue, it establishes that, that Beverly. from Beverly, Massachusetts to the, uh, I think it's the harbors of Boston or something like that. But it's a very specific reference that I have cross-checked with Marvel Excellent. just to be sure that within the context of the comic books, Captain Marvel is a Beverly resident. There you go. You also get that little hint in the name of Danvers, which happens to be the neighboring town. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, but, I thought that was a little know. overt myself, yeah. but hey, um, you know, up this way, so many Marvel characters, most of the DC characters are from fake, uh, fake oh, yeah, cities, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, right? yes. Marvel characters, the vast majority of them are from New from, York. Yeah. So the fact that we have anything to hang our hat on is wonderful, and the fact that it's absolutely. Beverly specific is I'm Don't just Don't get a lot of little towns you know? like that. Yeah, it's really, it's really something special for us, and you know, she, uh, her family summered in Maine, as okay. well as in the Cape. So right. some other towns can lay a little bit of a claim yeah, too. Yeah, so it's a New England deal. It's really cool um, just that, you know, like regionally, like we've got someone. Exactly. And man, her movie did awfully well too. It so. did. More to come, I'm More sure. More to come, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. if there's definitely going to be a second one of those after. Oh, no doubt about it. I think we're at 1.2 billion for Probably her. Probably something like that. But Goodness. Anthony, it's been great talking with you. It's a great pleasure. And Thank we'll you talk so to much. You again soon. Look forward to it. Okay. And we'll see you all again next month on Toy Talk.